It was a time when hundreds of thousands of GIs came home ready to start families, but had no place to live. In the 1930s, the federal government created the Federal Housing Administration, whose job it was to uh, provide loans or the backing for loans to average Americans so they could purchase a home. Federal programs and banks sank millions into the home construction industry. Their message to veterans, you can afford a new home, buy a new home now. Tax dollars help make the single-family home a mass-produced consumer item. The American dream had a new name, suburbia. We came to Levittown and we found the model house and we walked in and we looked around and uh, of course in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto, so to speak. It was an interesting experience, interesting lifestyle, seeing all the new modern conveniences. Very fascinating. Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized the national appraisal system, where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk so that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America, and it suburbanized it racially. As homes in white communities appreciated in value, the net worth of these white families grew. For most non-white families who stayed in urban neighborhoods, the housing market open to them in the 50s and 60s was largely a rental market. You don't gain equity by paying rent. Where one's family lives in America is not just a matter of, of taste and preference. You have the issue of housing and wealth. The majority of Americans hold most of their wealth in the form of home equity. So that's their nest egg. That's how they can finance the education of their offspring. That's how they can um, sort of save up for retirement. Um, it's their savings bank, right? They're living in their savings bank. My family, like a lot of families, was in Detroit struggling to buy a house. You had a dual housing market, one white, one black. A housing market with one with a lot of demand, another housing market with very little demand. My father lives in the house that I grew up in. 
the house today, five bedroom house, is worth about twenty thousand dollars. That same house bought in the suburbs would be worth today about three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So whites moving to the suburb were being subsidized in the accumulation of wealth, while blacks were being divested. And these were public policy decisions, in which, on one hand, people were given access to property, um, given title, and subsequently wealth, and on another hand, where people were not given access to property, did not generate wealth, and did not generate the kind of opportunity for the next generation.